Thanks for thanks everybody for tuning in and, and uh, listening to this talk today. It's something that is extremely important to me, and I'm going to dive into a little bit of the different aspects of why it's important to me um, and why I think why I think it's important to all of us as coaches and people in different leadership spots. Um, I'm going to start out just. Uh, I appreciate the background that that Dave gave, and I, I just want to kind of fill in a, a couple spots too, and and just give a little bit more about me. Uh, first of all, though, thanks to Chris at, at basketball immersion and, and Chris and Tanner at Golden Ticket Sports, all awesome guys and I appreciate them having me. Um, this is, we're coming up now and I just realized this the other day that, that I'm about 10 years into uh, coaching post-secondary basketball, which for some of you watching um, is a drop in the bucket and I appreciate that very much. And But for me, um, 10 years is significant because it's literally a third of my life. So um, that's that we're right on top of that anniversary. And like Dave mentioned, it it started where Coach Swords, uh, Sean, was awesome to give me the opportunity to help out at Laurentian uh, years ago. And, and it's gone through coaching men and women and, and all that kind of stuff. And today I'm not really, I'm, I'm not, not only am I not really, I'm not at all speaking, trying to come off as an expert basketball coach. Um, you can ask many of my athletes and the people I've worked with, and, and I'm definitely not that. Uh, and if you ever want to debate the term expert anything, then I'm happy to do that because I do it all the time in my work with the Boost Institute as well. Um, what I am here today though is, is to talk as the, the owner and founder of the Boost Institute. And the owner and founder role at the Boost Institute is really about collaboration and data creation. Uh, what we're striving to do here is, is answer some questions that I've had over my time coaching so far, but also things that I think are really important to uh, consider and build on. And, and the reason for that is that right now, uh, a couple interesting stats really sparked my tough conversation thought process before we got into the data collection and the building of different modeling around it with our company. And the first, the first stat was just about a billion people per day access Instagram. Um, and, and that's, that's a massive number. And, and the first thing that I thought of when I saw that stat is that we really need to start to make sure that we're updating our, our data and our practices much more regularly, in my opinion, than we are now. And, and much more regularly, like to the point where there, there is no update that's coming too soon. We need to really pay attention, be constantly collecting data from kids, from coaches, from adults, from people in business and education, and, and just learning as much as we can about all of these different people because people are changing much faster um, by nature of, of technology and the amount we access it. And the second thing about the Instagram stat that I found really interesting is that if a billion people are accessing it, there's about 500 million people that are using just the story feature. And for those of you that aren't Instagram savvy, though, based on the stats I just gave, many of you, if, if not um, a, a very, very high percentage of you are on Instagram regularly, I would just say that those stories are really short and just like TikTok and Snapchat, we're, we're cutting down our intervals and, and it, our, our learning time, our, our actual effective learning time is dropping constantly. And I know Mike McKay has spoken about that uh, before and he speaks about it in his clinics and he, about, about the rule of three and 30 and, and there, he's bang on with that because we, we are changing really fast and our attention spans are getting shorter. But there's also something that's changing with that. And, and our, as I dove deeper into the psychology side, because a lot of what we do at the Boost Institute is physiologically and psychologically based in, in terms of the science, we started, to, we started to realize that not only is our attention span getting shorter, but we're also seeing our ability to withstand uh, challenge, change, transformation, and that kind of thing. And this is anecdotal evidence I'll talk about a minute, in a minute, is also getting shorter. So, what we did as the Boost Institute came to be, and we do training, we do consulting, but a major part of what we do is trying to learn and, and gather data points and grow our data points as much as possible. And so to do that, just so that you know where a lot of the information I'm going to talk about today comes from, we, we built a large pool of information that came from different advisors. That We, we have an advisory team at the Boost Institute um, that's super robust, and I'm really fortunate to be able to work with them. They include people who are uh, doctors in education in various capacities of education um, from both in and outside Canada, uh, a couple neuroscience experts and, and coaches and trainers in that field specifically, um, and, and involved in sport at the same time. Uh, professional storytellers, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit today about the role of storytelling 
in in team relationships, tough conversations, and and beyond that, and really in how we connect to others. Um, obviously, data experts, so people who help us to construct how we get our data and what we do with it once we get it, and what we consider to be significant data in terms of whether or not we're actually going to use it in a conversation like today or use it in a document like you'll see today. Um, when we when when we build things for specific people, so when we build things for specific coaches or or teachers, uh, many of our programming is super targeted. So when we get hired, we'll deliver a similar v version of something that we've delivered before, but it's very targeted to data that we collect from the class, the team, uh, the business, wherever that we go. So it's it's targeted as much as we can possibly make it in the time window that we're given. And because of that, our advisor team is built up of other consultants. Um, and, uh, and coaches and teachers in, in their specific field as well all the time. Before I really dive into the idea of tough conversations today, uh, I, I, I just wanna talk about a quote from Robin Sharma that I think is a really good tool to remind ourselves how important it is to wanna have a tough conversation or, or wanna challenge ourselves to be a little bit more blunt and uh, straight up and maybe, maybe just a little bit more honest with ourselves and with the people or person we're talking to. And what he said was the fear that, the fear that you don't face will become your wall. And I think that that's super true in terms of how we approach having tough conversation. If we are afraid to hurt feelings or if we are afraid to say something um, in a very clear and concise way that will actually help someone get better and improve, that's going to eventually become our downfall, especially in my opinion, especially in a coaching role, um, and especially in, in, in my experience, I've, I've failed at that. I've, I've been in a situation where I've avoided those conversations and it's come back to bite me and I think we can all very much think of some of those moments. So when we go into tough conversations, before I, before I pull up our graphic and before we start talking about um, the very specific stuff that we've, that we've put in our guide, I just want to talk about the idea of having a personal philosophy and coaching, coaching philosophy is definitely a part of that. And I think that's super important. And I remember, um, I just, I, I'm pretty sure it was Mike cause I've taken so many courses from coach McKay now, but, uh, I remember some, somebody, and, and I do think it was Mike talking about the real importance of having that philosophy. And for those of us that, that have taught or anything like that, we understand that in teaching and the serious value of our teaching philosophy, but we also have, we also have our coaching philosophy, and many of us don't always stretch that into a personal philosophy. It's something that guides us, um, something that we can use in order, to, in order to guide our decision making, in order to guide ourselves in times of challenge, stress, um, non-clinical anxiety, and, and stuff like that. So the first thing I'd like to talk about here is just an adapted version um, that we have of our philosophy creation. And I invite you to, at any point, you can you can uh, you can screenshot this if you want it, or you can ask me for it later, and I'm happy to share it. Um, I've I've adapted this from Compete to Create, which is uh, Dr. Michael Gervais and Pete Carroll of the Seattle Seahawks company, um, and and I haven't changed that much because it's pretty good. So credit to them, but I've I've just tried to simplify it a little bit, and we use this in many of our work, um, much of our work with different people. And so when we talk about building our our performance philosophy or our personal philosophy, I think that it's really important to draw on things that, that we're already committed to. The things that when a question like, who are people that you look up to and what do they stand for? That's a question that most of us can answer quite quickly and easily. Same thing with what are your favorite quotes? What are your favorite words? These are things that we can pull on because they're, they're so deeply ingrained in us. And when it comes to performance, or when it comes to a personal guiding philosophy, utilizing, utilizing these things that are really at the root of us is something that's going to take some serious uh, mindfulness and some practice, but it's also important to understand that the things that are right there when the question gets asked are often already the things that are at the root of that question or that answer for us. So you can see here that what we would often do, and I invite you to start doing this now while I'm talking. Uh, I've taught college and university now for six years, so I'm, I'm really used to people looking down at their phones or, or uh, not paying complete attention to me when I'm talking, no matter how engaging and funny I might be. Um, and I can't even see you, so it actually works out really well. I'm just assuming that everybody's locked right into me uh, throughout the entire talk. 
but as you go through this, what you start to find is that you really, you really kind of narrow down and, and, and start to get to a point where it, it tightens up. Uh, your philosophy becomes something that's really rooted in who you are as a person. And I challenge you to make this philosophy, the one that you're going to try and pull on in times of ch tough or challenging conversations, something that connects more with who you are and not so much with what you do. And I think that there's an important distinction there that when we make a coaching or teaching philosophy, and I'm by no means saying this is wrong, I actually think that, that it's extremely important to do this for those specific fields. But many times those philosophies become about what we're doing, we're, about us as a teacher or us as a coach. And like I said, it should be that. But when we're putting a philosophy that we can use in situations where we're trying to help someone manage a tough something tough that we might be saying or help someone manage challenge change or stuff or something like that i believe and and what we really try and press on people is that it's much more it's much more impactful to have that connect with who you are not what you're doing so when i'm having a tough conversation with you right now i want to i want you to be connecting with ken i don't want you to be connecting necessarily with coach king um that's one of my my less data focused aspects and a little bit more of my anecdotal aspects that I'll talk about today. But like I said, I'm happy to share this document um, and you can steal it from the screen, uh, even though it's gone now. Um, as, we, as we dive in deeper to the tough conversation aspect, I just wanna be very clear that for many of us, especially our, our coaches, um, when I say tough conversation, a lot of us are thinking we're cutting someone um, or we've decided not to offer somebody something if you're at the post-secondary level or maybe you've got to play on a lower team if we're talking about a club and there's multiple levels of teams for the same age group or something like that. We're thinking about quote unquote larger tough conversations. But I, I, though this will help with that and that is the ultimate goal, anytime we're talking about psychological tools, anytime we're talking about improving ourselves in something like change management or, or um, even things like grit or resiliency, which we work with a lot at the Boost Institute, I would be I would be very careful with just trying to implement those in the, in any kind of large moment. It's no different than than having an athlete try and take a three for the first time in game. Um, we want them to make mistakes and and we want them to we want them to try new things and and I'm I'm by no means advocating that that we don't let them take that shot. But it's probably not going to go as well as if we practice the same skill in a blocked way in a random way outside of that outside of that competition moment or that big moment. So when I, I will challenge you today to really try to look at our tough conversation work as something that you can implement in some of those smaller tough conversations, the ones that you're not having. So the, the ones where I, I'm gonna reduce your playing time, but I'm gonna wait for you to ask the question about why you played less as opposed to the, if I know it's coming, just approaching you and telling you beforehand and telling you why. Um, if we're, if we're going to recruit somebody who's at your position and I'm just going to assume that you understand that there's competitiveness at our level or, uh, and that you always, that your spots never guaranteed or something like that, having a tough conversation there that maybe isn't that tough, but it's tough to actually think to have it. And the difference in the lead up might be, might be something that front loads and, and that's a common Brene Brown term now, but front loads, front loads the fact that there's going to be challenge and stress and change coming ahead. And I'm gonna have an honest and, and potentially tough conversation with you to help you prep for that. And I think that's really important. So try and put both lenses on it. As I, as I dive into this document here, um, our practical guide for tough conversation, what I want to start with is that our guiding people for this document is really Abraham Maslow and Carl Jung, and really trying to use those two people in, in, synchroni in synchronicity in order to develop a, develop a guide that works as more of a matrix, not a step-by-step -step process, but more of a matrix that we can really build our capabilities in both ourselves, but also our athletes. And when, when I'm going to, because most of the people that are, that are going to watch and listen to this are going to be in the leadership position of coach or teacher, coach or teacher, uh, maybe even parent, something like that. I'm going to use that lens a lot in my examples, but I'm also going to reference multiple times that 
talking about this document with your team or your students or, or your children or whoever you're gonna be using maybe some of the tools in here with is going to make a massive difference in making it useful. And I'll address a couple of those points as we go. But really, this is, got, this is something that's designed to be threaded, embedded, and used throughout a group's culture. As a guide that we're both using in conversation without having to talk about it but we have talked about it so much before the actual conversation that it's now something that we're both applying without kind of being like, oh, we're in this zone right now. Let's go back to this. It's not meant to be that. It's more meant to be a reference, a tool, a dictionary, uh, if you will, or if you prefer uh, thesaurus, you can, you can call it whatever you want, but it is just, it is just that. So when I'll, I'll bounce the Maslow and Carl Jung stuff in and out just to, just to make sure that, that it's clear, but a, a little background is that Abraham Maslow is hierarchy of needs and, and really making sure that we know what we need, that we get certain aspects of our needs before we move on to the next one. An interesting thing about that though, is that Abraham Maslow didn't draw a pyramid. Uh, he his, that, that came later. And originally the needs were just all, kind of in a bit of a matrix and and kind of something where we're, we were just talking about different aspects of needs and if you think about your needs it's not like when you turned 18 and you realized that you had shelter and, and food and and your physical safety was taken care of that you never worried about that again uh, i think i think any adult and and unfortunately even some children have bounced back in and out of different areas of needing certain things in their lives and it's not something where you just check that base level the pyramid off and you're good to go it's something that you have to come back to more often and, and make sure that you revisit different aspects of your needs so that's kind of the maslow aspect to this guide the jung aspect to the guide is really that if you if you imagine a ping pong game and on one half of the court is is abraham maslow's needs and on the other side it's carl jung, carl jung's self-actualization where we're really in that constant that constant journey of trying to become more who we're meant to be there's there's no end there's there's no destination there's no goal but we're really on that constant journey to try to get there um and in the ping pong game the ball's going to be on one side of the court and it's going to bounce back and forth throughout and it's super challenging to be in to be in both areas at once but if we're very aware of where we are at each given time we can, we can really start to, to understand that right now I'm coming at this conversation or my thoughts right now are happening because I'm really just trying to focus on my needs and addressing my, my root needs. Or am I on the other end, the other side of the ping pong table for that, for that moment the ball hits where now I'm really just trying to address um, something I'm trying to learn and I'm really I'm really looking at growth and, and and exploring areas of myself and the world around me and the people I'm communicating with that I don't know anything about or I know very little about if we can be very aware of that it makes a massive difference in terms of our ability to respond appropriately whether it's a conversation or a host of other things so looking at the guide in particular uh, I, I want to be very clear that working through tough conversations is not a straight line. Uh, it's, and I, we are not great. I, we actually just hired a marketing and design person on Friday at the company who's probably going to make these things a little bit better. And I, but I, I honestly think that this one's really tight right now, but in terms of, in terms of the, the way that our graphics are laid out and everything like that, be kind because, um, uh, we're, we're not necessarily graphic designers yet though. I guess as of Monday, we will be. Um, a little bit more capable of that, but it's not totally linear. This whole graphic you're about to see, we bounce in and out of, and it's just a guide. So please, please don't take this and start trying to, especially with spouses. So that's really the last thing that I want to um, be held accountable to. I don't start working through it because as you'll see, as we go through it, it's, it's a pretty dynamic document. And it's been created in partnership with experts in the field and with data that we've collected over a couple of years, uh, largely anecdotal data. And it's taken some time as a lot of our data is because it's feedback from video when we're training and, and consulting. It's feedback from forms that we've gotten and we've had to sift through to find common themes and words 
and so on and so forth. So um, the data is, is uh, it's subjective data and we continue to build it at all times. So that's, that's an important feature as well. So when we, look at our, when we look at our guide itself, our zones of conversation are on the left and we're gonna kind of flow in and out of each of these zones. There's specific tools that, that flow with each zone. So when we talk about our first one, the warm-up area, this is, if you think about the warm-up zone of any conversation, it doesn't actually happen in the conversation. Uh, this, would be, this would be like your general warm-up before your specific warm-up on court. Maybe it's happening in the hallway before you actually get in the gym. The warm-up zone in the conversation, this is, our, this is a major Maslow area. Have you eaten enough? Have you slept enough? Have you drank water? And have you moved and been outside that day? Five, five needs that, that you maybe can't do it before the conversation, but being aware of whether or not you've done it makes a massive difference in how you approach a conversation. Because as many of us know, if I know I'm hungry going into it, whether it's a good conversation or a bad conversation, I can be a lot more aware that maybe I'm gonna be a little more short tempered. I literally just ate a bunch right before I came on here, not because I'm worried about getting, getting short tempered while I'm talking to a camera, but I ate a bunch because I know that it's going to actually neurologically help me fire on point. Um, same thing with water, like I've got water right here. You're probably gonna see me start sipping from it soon because I'm trying to make sure that Maslow's stuff is taken care of. I wanna cover my Maslow bases. And now we connect back in our philosophy, our personal or our performance philosophy. And this is one of the most valuable things that I think that, may, that we can implement in culturally in a team, where if we have a philosophy for myself as a coach and my 15 athletes have the same philosophy, and let's just imagine for a minute that, that all our philosophies are on a board and I can, I can see all my athletes' philosophies and they can change any time, they can edit them. That's, it's your right, it's your philosophy. But if I look at somebody's philosophy right before I talk to them and they use words in their philosophy or, or they're referencing people and it's like integrity or honesty or character, that's definitely going to shape how I approach or how, how I approach that conversation. It's, it's definitely going to change how I react to them. And it's definitely going to be a massive guide. So what, what my vision for the conversation is going to be, is going to be based on the things that we're talking about, but, the, my framework and character, their framework and character can be guided a lot by embedding philosophy and, and throughout a culture, throughout a team, throughout a classroom. Um, and it, it, it'll make a big difference as we come back to some other areas. So moving down into what we refer to as the empathy zone when we're having these conversations, the first thing that, that physiologically and psychologically is extremely important is to establish your presence. And I, I mean... I don't, I don't mean establish your presence, like making sure you're the alpha. I mean, establish your presence by getting some belly breaths in, by trying to relax and be in that moment as much as possible, by really ensuring that you're not thinking and addressing things that have happened in terms of this part of the conversation and that you're not thinking about the what ifs that are out of your control. In this first kind of moment of initiating the conversation, making sure that you establish presence is going to be key because it keeps you on controllables and not bouncing into uncontrollables. And that goes hand in hand with prioritizing space, making sure that we allow for enough space in a conversation with somebody else is 100% always important. But anytime there's an emotional response, making sure that there's space and time, silence and active listening are being employed appropriately so that we can actually have the room for that person to think and articulate thoughts. I have been guilty many times of having athletes say something to me and they're, they've just started talking and I already know what I'm gonna say in response. And maybe I'm right and I'm really putting all my chips in on the fact that, I'm, that I might be right about off the first part of what they said but I've stopped active listening. I'm not allowing a lot of space. I'm not taking 10 seconds after they talk to see if they want to add on. I'm not, I'm not making sure that I speak slowly in response and that I am making eye contact. I'm not doing the things that allow for space for the conversation to ebb and flow and breathe and, and have the room that it needs. When we, and, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the non-linearity of this in a minute, but when we, when we get ourselves kind of as present as possible, 
when we move ourselves to the spot where we're, we really feel like we're actively listening and we're allowing for space and room for that conversation to grow and ebb and flow, like I mentioned, now we can really start to move to a, the clarity zone or, or the area where we're trying to really seek our facts, our learning focuses and try and find some growth. And the facts are just what we know to be real and what is within our control. They're gonna lead to results, but they're much more challenging to hear sometimes. So the facts might be, you're not gonna play as much today as you're used to playing. That's, that is in my control and, it's a, and I know it to be a fact at that point. I'm not, like, I, I don't know that I would necessarily say that to somebody before a game with all the factors that could go on a game, but it's just an example. Now we, we need to find the clarity of feelings too. And one of these does not sit above the other. They work in synchronicity and making sure that we address the facts by seeking them out and address the feelings by seeking them out will allow us to have a little bit more balance between, between that, let's, keep it, let, let's try to keep the emotions to a level where we continue to grow and learn. And let's not allow growth and learning to become so much the focus that I'm just hammering you with something really challenging or something really blunt or something really hard to hear. But I'm also making sure that I'm seeking your feelings and making sure, making sure that we're, we kind of calm that situation down. And I put delivery at the end and, and intentionally delivery is the smallest zone in this because I, I'm not here to tell you when you should decide to have a tough conversation. That's too individualized. And I'm not here to speak to what we should be, what we should be saying word for word. Cause I also believe that if you're, if you're taking that from me, then you're not showing up as authentically as you need to. And generally the person that you're having a conversation with is going to see right through that. But I do think that the, whenever the information gets delivered, so this delivery zone could occur at the very beginning, this delivery zone could occur at the end of the conversation. This, it could occur in the middle. It could occur multiple times. Maybe you've got a couple of things, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't load too much into one that you wanna hit. Keep it brief, keep it clear, and be honest. And this is, this is one that I find myself skirting a little bit when, when I'm not doing a good job in these conversations where, I come in and it starts with a, with a statement. Um, let, let's, come, let's stick to the playing time one because I think many of us have playing time uh, conversations. And somebody, somebody comes to me and they ask why they're not playing. So this is an after the fact um, and they, they want to know how to get more minutes and they're, ask, they're asking it appropriately. They're not addressing it in, in an aggressive way or, or disrespectful way or anything like that. And I start out by saying, well, to be honest, you're not, you're not as good as this person and this person. Nice and brief, nice and clear. And I follow that up with a little bit of uh, feedback about how we can build and grow and, and catch you up to that person. If what I get back is some tears and some anger or any other host of emotions, it suddenly gets a little bit more easy for me to get a little less honest where it's like, well, I didn't, like they, they, this person was just better than you that this day or this, and now I put, and now I'm quantifying and now my honesty level is going down. Maybe I'm not like, I'm not saying I'm lying, but my honesty level is dropping. And, and now there's gray area. And I'm going to, when I talk to some of our, when I wrap up with some of our uh, feedback that we've gotten from athletes and students, this brief, clear, honest portion and, and honest really being something, it, it, can, it can be super fact oriented if we come back here, super learning and growth focused, which is good, we need that. As I said, these are all equally important. But we do need to make sure that if, as we stay on that really honest side, we allow for feelings to calm and stay in that empathetic zone, but that we also stay honest. That, that, that we don't allow that honesty to start to waver, that that honesty doesn't, doesn't ebb and flow with the conversation. The honesty is also going to be something that if we don't have a really solid philosophy, whether it's personal coaching, teaching, or a combination coming in, it's going to be really easy to waver on your honesty. And though the, the delivery portion is the smallest, because I think the, I, I don't think, I know it to be true that these other three zones are, are by far the biggest impact in how we respond and approach the, the conversation. Those three words, brief, clear, and honest, 
are, are really key in, in terms of making sure that our delivery is growth and learning oriented. And here we have, uh, at any point, if, if negative emotions, and I, it's specifically written as perceived negative emotions, start to get too high, then, then let's create some more space and return to some facts. No, I didn't say you're never going to be better than that person. I said right now, or for this past week, she's been better than you, and that's why she played more than you this weekend. And if you want to put stats to it, put stats to it by all means. That's, I, in my opinion, that's a, that's a philosophical decision. But we need to, we need to make sure that we're, we're being aware of when we may want to recreate some, some space and, and give some time. And, and even if that means taking a break from the conversation, but really trying to get back to the empathy part. I think that what we what we know, and this is this is all this is our expert and our data side that that has driven the reason why we've created the document the way that we have, is that many of the people we talk to, and this is adults and children, so we've combined all the responses here, want more blunt and tough conversations to help learn and perform. I think many of us who who coach uh, and teach uh, for the majority of the year we get that feedback a fair bit. Like, be honest with me, coach. Like, just tell me. That's, like, that's what I want. I just want. I just want you to tell me what's up. <laughs> but the really interesting part is, and, and without showing all the individual responses that we've gone through, is that many of the same people that said they want those also stated that they don't feel equipped to actually have one or respond properly to it or carry it out. Um, and so because of that, they're going to avoid definitely initiating them. I don't know how many times I've had a, an athlete come to me with something and it's like, why wouldn't, why didn't you bring this up sooner? Well, it's, it's because they have no idea how to, how to go through this kind of process. And that's why I really believe that the more that a document or at least the concepts, um, can get threaded and, and utilized throughout a culture in a team, the more we get people who, if you want the tough conversation, okay, let's go. Your self-efficacy is high. Your confidence is high. You've you looked at these tools. We practice it on a daily basis, both with your teammates and with your leaders in terms of the coaching staff or, or whoever else. One of the words that we identified very, very often in, in our data was that the word wrong came up a ton. And in some of our anecdotal data, so some of our one-on-one -on -one conversations, stuff like that, uh, we, started to, we started to speak about this more and more. And one of the really, really big things that we, that we noticed in this was that as soon as they, as soon as especially youth athletes are, and students are involved in what they think is about to be a tough conversation. Their initial feeling is feeling wrong. So I just said, hey, can I talk to you for a moment? And whether it's through body language or whatever else, or maybe I say, I, like, I, I, can, we're gonna have a meeting later today, please. Uh, you can bring a teammate if you want. Most athletes know what kind of conversation that could be. And when we have those, they oftentimes are stating that they approach it feeling wrong. And that brings us all the way back up here to where we really are looking at our, our needs. And if I'm addressing someone who feels wrong before I've even gotten into it, the challenge of getting them out of the, uh, the high level of negative emotion and into a place where they're present, their needs are taken care of, they can, they're, they're at least relaxed enough so that they can start to identify facts and we can weed through feelings is going to be much greater because all the, they felt wrong from the second I started talking. And the last thing that I'm going to just say here before we go into questions, because I would like this to be as much discussion or whatever you would call responding to written questions um, as possible, is that it's a skill and it's got to be practiced. And that's why I, I'm, we literally have been involved in groups where it becomes a part of what they're, they want to pay us for is to have these conversations. And early on as a company, 
I'm all to be totally honest, we would be willing to do that. Um, cause we're, we're a new company and, and it's, it, some people want to just pay to have somebody else have some of these conversations and in my learning and, and my maturing as a, as a company, somebody running the company, I've really realized that that, that sits on the wrong side of the line for me. And that the fact that somebody wants to just pay to have some of these conversations, uh, some, so somebody else has them, I should say, is, is not really what we should be trying to build and grow as, as leaders, coaches, teachers, parents, et cetera. Really, it's about building capacity. It's about making sure that we have a culture around having tough conversations. Like this is all just a, this is all just a guide from one company who's, who's talked to people and done some research. I think that it's pretty friggin' cool. I think that I wish I had it when I was messing this up with, with athletes in the past. But it doesn't mean that, that it doesn't mean that it's perfect, and and I think that something's better than nothing. So if at any point you can have something where it's like, if you need to talk to someone, it's not going to be easy. Then here's the things that you need to at least have in your head. Are you thinking about where they're at? Are you thinking about what the facts are? Are you thinking about what the feelings are, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And like I said at the beginning, it's a skill that that has to be practiced in the in the micro doses, the little tough conversations, not just let's hit it with a really big one right now and, and see how it goes. I, with that, I, I'll, uh, I'll bounce back in here to Dave and his questions. Yeah. Thanks, Ken. I think uh, as watching that, I think all coaches can relate to that. We all have to have those tough conversations. So uh, we have a few questions we're going to get through, so I'll throw them at you. Um, so first one I'm going to throw at you is, is, you talked about, you know, going into the meeting and being able to listen to the athlete, but as coaches, we always have points we want to make too. So how do you balance that? How do you make sure you get what you want to say, but you're in the moment listening to the athlete? Yeah, I think, I think a big piece, I'll come back in, um, a big piece, a big piece to that, that we're really hearing in terms of the feedback is that young kids and even like that 25 and under number that I have on the guide is really important because that hits a lot of us at the post-secondary level as well. They know a lot more about when we're really taking what they're putting down than we think they do. Um, and we have a lot of data. We have a lot more data, I would say from athletes that are 18 or under 18. So 17 and under that is that talks about how, when, when we're responding to things, they're, they're really reading body language without knowing it, and they're creating their framework and their lens for that conversation. And I think simplicity becomes a really key piece where it's, it, we've, we all have some athletes where maybe we are due for two or three different topics of tough conversation with one person. But when we start to compound it, when we start to apply too many things into one situation, there that feeling of wrong that feeling of kind of getting getting attacked is there almost no matter how we approach it they they just they're not equipped for that especially with the with the way that their world works where they can immerse themselves into things that they that only make them feel good on social media and stuff like that so i guess the short answer would just be try try and really stay simple Try and really try and really make sure that the the space we're creating is is there and the presence is there so that the authenticity is there. Okay, perfect. You talked about philosophy, and this question is a kind of a multi part. But asking about do you change or how do you change your philosophy year to year? So your athletes change. Should your key tenets and philosophy follow with that? You know, you had to have a baseline. It worked, but sometimes they need to start a new. How do you recognize that you might need change? So a couple questions in that, but. What are your thoughts? Yeah, that's, that's a really good one. And I think the, the simplest way to answer that would be that if, if you think about your philosophy as the weather and how we respond to it, um, or sorry, if you think about yourself as, as, as how your philosophy as you and how you respond to the weather, then you have to adapt to every given environment that you're in. I would actually state that my philosophy and, and the philosophy, the concept of a personal philosophy or a performance philosophy is really something that has to be willing to change in scenario to scenario or environment to environment. 
um, especially, especially in a coaching context where it's so dynamic. And what I would draw from here would be some of the research that we've done with one of our, with one of our advisory people who's worked with Navy SEALs. And what she talks about a lot is, is just how they all have this really core personal kind of value system that guides them in really challenging moments that they obviously see all the time. But then they take that and they introduce into a dynamic environment. And because of that, it's, if they were to stay rigid with just what they think in that moment and what their system of beliefs or their framework is in that moment, it could be dire. It could have, it could have some pretty bad consequences. And on a way different scale, coaching is very much that. We'll take our maybe pretty rigid philosophy or something that's really particular to us, and then we're going to put it into a dynamic environment where there's going to be different things coming at us all the time. And in that setting, it, it, the, and I don't want to kind of beat the dead horse here, but it's like that presence and that ability to realize where, where am I and the person I'm talking to at in terms of our needs or our self-actualization side. If this person's in a great place, so they've come off the floor and they're feeling really good and they don't even know that I'm about to come, that we're about to have a bit of a tough chat about something on the bench or maybe at halftime or something like that because if we have to then they might actually be in a place where it's like they're ready to learn their, their self-actualization Carl Jung stuff is like, boom, 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 boom. Like we're, we're ready. Like I feel good coach. Uh, but that athlete that has just made four mistakes and come off is going to be in a different place where I might have to approach that a little bit different and, and tweak or lean or be flexible in my philosophy. So not only would I say that I would, the, a philosophy can and would change year to year, I would say that it changes dynamic situation to dynamic situation. Um, somebody's late, somebody's late for practice. And then all of a sudden a second person's late for practice. This might change how you deal with it because now you've got like 10% of your team present maybe is, is, has walked in late for practice and you've got to make a decision that you might not make if just one person showed up late. Yeah. Thanks for that. Uh, you know, again, a, a deep subject I'm sure you can get into, but that helps for sure. Uh, talking about tough conversations, coaches wondering, how do you feel about having another person with you? You know, obviously when you're dealing with athletes, things can, can get heard different ways. What are your thoughts on, on bringing someone in and how would you bring them into your approach that you're talking about? Bring that into the meeting. Yeah, there's, there's a really challenging hurdle to get over as soon as we get away from clarity and honesty. And that hurdle, that hurdle becomes bigger as the more, the more that we kind of dance with what the actual facts are in the conversation. And if you look at it as a dance where I'm the one trying to deliver facts and the other person who's receiving them is going to kind of, they might, they're kind of dancing around those facts. Like, yeah, you're not, you haven't been performing as well as this other person. That's why you're not playing well, okay. I don't like, I don't, I, I disagree coach. I think I'm better than them. Like, okay. Well, here's the number. It's like, this is, I can like, let's, I've got, I, I know it. So now I'm going to prove it and we're going to, we're going to stay with the facts here. Well, I really, I really feel like, I really feel like I'm better and I just haven't been that good for the last couple of days. Well, this, this is an area where now we can start to dance with them and start to be like, well, actually, yeah, like maybe, maybe you, it has just been a rough couple of days. Maybe, Maybe this, maybe, maybe you do deserve another chance. Let me think about that and I'll come back to you. Well, now, now the, now the clarity is gone. Now the, the honesty is dropped. And because of that, there's, there's going to need to be some work to build that back up. And we don't talk about it a lot in the document itself, but really what we're discussing here is the concept of building and, and tearing down trust. And that if trust is high in the culture before, there's going to be some more leeway and some better reception to facts and that blunt, tough conversation atmosphere. If you have a trusting environment that's well with well-developed relationships, good communication strategies, something like this included or something different, but similar included. And in that conversation itself, you're, you've developed a good level of presence and good level of space it's pretty hard for that person to dance with the conversation. But if trust is low, if there's no background in the culture that really supports it, if the relationship isn't as strong as you think it is, or, or it just isn't very strong at all, 
and then honesty or clarity start to go away, now all of a sudden the dance gets a little bit easier. It goes from goes from being like what would have been a, a really challenging rumba to a little bit of a macarena. I love the macarena reference. A couple of other good ones to squeeze in here, so we want to try to get to them. Uh, do you have any well-tested disarming scripts to open tough conversations? Yeah, so <laughs> that, that, yes. <laughs> I guess I guess would be the way to answer that the most simply. I like I mentioned, um, I have I have some strategies that I've developed and and is and I've tweaked them recently, largely as we look at our work. Um, I shy away from teaching them too much on a large scale because I do believe that these it's better to have a framework and a guide than to have a script. Because again, even even a ten year old athlete knows when you're when you're just giving them the same thing, and uh, as as many of us know, if we're working with the same general group for a year or two years or five years, if I start rhyming off the same response to in in a bit of a scripted format to multiple athletes, it's going to take all of three text messages before the whole team knows that that's just how I bounce stuff back. So I think having dynamic response ability is more important than having some scripts, but. If, if uh, anybody wants to reach out with kind of how I've created my typical internal dialogue, then we can always talk about that. Okay, uh, I'll put you in a situation here. So you're in the midst of a tough conversation. Your athlete says something you're not prepared for. What guidelines do you recommend on thinking and talking through this conversation? Mm. So this is, I literally, like this can, can it takes me directly back to one and, and I can't give the example for privacy re reasons, but we were having a, I'd initiated a tough conversation um, and the athlete came back with a response that was uh, terrible. It was, it, it's one of the worst responses that, that you could ever have as a coach it had nothing to do with our conversation and something bad had happened in her life and it, and the whole thing got derailed. And I think that that's really, if you think about where the caution symbol is on there, where an emotional level or a perceived emotional level starts to get high, let's walk it all the way back to empathy. This curveball is just coming in the conversation. Let's create some space. You just drop this on me. I'm telling you right now, I'm not responding for at least 15 seconds. And I'll literally count in my head. And in that time, I'm breathing. I'm breathing through my nose. I'm breathing into my belly. And it sounds cheesy, but that if I were to say anything scripted for me, silence and belly breathing is something I script into every challenging conversation because all of a sudden it becomes a lot easier to hit a curveball when you're in the moment. But if you're, if you're trying to, if you're running around like a chicken with your head cut off and all of a sudden somebody gives you that curveball, then it's, it's astronomically more challenging. Okay. Uh, another one, maybe the last one here, Ken, what is your approach to having these tough conversations with players at tryouts? How would you go about doing this? Yeah, I, the trial one comes up a lot for for me and, and for um, a couple of the people that are that I work with. We've talked about it a fair amount. What's the best way to cut an athlete? Do you post a list? Do you have the conversation? Hundred percent, I'm on the side of having a conversation. I, I and and initiating a conversation front load front load as much as possible with the athletes that everybody's going to get talked to, regardless of whether they make or miss a team. I think that that connection piece is really important. And I also think that in, in any moment, and we stole some of, some of this stuff from um, a little bit of the tactics that doctors and other medical professionals use when they have to give really bad news. And it's just that it becomes a moment where facts, need, facts will be delivered quick and feelings will, will ha take up the majority of the space in the conversation. So you're not going to be on the team this year. I appreciate all the work you put in. And then the, a big amount of space after that statement for them to get to ask questions and give and, and give their feelings and that kind of thing. And then when they start asking questions in what might be kind of a sad or, or angry way, you making sure that you don't get caught up in that emotion, you're breathing, you're creating space, and you're responding to, again, quick facts, and then more space for them. So I guess the simple way to look at it would be the more emotional you know the conversation is going to be and cutting someone is always an emotional conversation. Make sure that you're really erring on creating a bunch of space for feelings and really leaving just a little bit to deliver really clear, brief, and honest facts. I get the last question, uh, and it's a question I know uh, that you put a lot of work into this, so give me uh, some great podcasts or books that you really like or resources, besides your own, of course, uh, that you'll talk uh, about. But 
Uh, it, what are some things that coaches that you would recommend for coaches to check out? That's a really good one. And I, I have kind of a core group of books that I really go back to over and over again um, that help guide me. And one of the, one of the books that I've used a lot and I think that it's applicable over and over again is uh, the five people you meet in heaven. Um, that's, that's a really, really solid book for me that brings me back to, to, I guess just having really good perspective. And then, uh, one of the books that we actually use as, as a text, and he's actually the, one of the professional storytellers that we work with. His name is Matthew Dix. He has a uh, book that came out in 2019 called 21 truths about love. It's not really a love story at all. Um, and it's, it, it's got some really good insight into taking risks and doing things that, that you might, uh, you might've been a little bit, a little bit nervous to try or, or something like that. And, uh, it's, it's also written in lists. It's not so for coaches who tend to, I have a lot of coach friends who have very short attention spans. They don't want to sit down and read a whole book. This whole book's written in lists. It's literally bullet points and it's, it's, but it's a really good read. And then podcasts. Um, I have a good friend of mine and one of the people I work with closely is named Trevor Reagan. Uh, he, runs a company called, well, currently they're their Learner Lab and the podcast is called the Learner Lab or Learner Lab. Um, previously they were uh, train ugly and, and a lot of their concepts have, they go, they've gone around a lot in volleyball and other things, but him and I have known each other for a long time and great coaching and teaching resource. Well, thanks again for your session. It's obviously you have a, a passion for this topic and there's a lot of things and uh, we've had some coaches kind of ask for, you know, some more information. So, I'm going to give you the final word. You can uh, let them know where they can contact you and then I'll, I'll wrap it up. Yeah. I, I just, thanks again. Thanks Dave for being here. And, and um, it is nice to have a familiar face because you're the only face that I get to look at through the whole time. So I appreciate that. But I also, uh, I know a lot of people are probably getting uh, amped up. I get, to, I get to be the opening act for somebody. I know a lot of people have been <laughs> looking forward to through the conference. And I just a quick story about the fact that, when I was still coaching with Sean, uh, Roy Rana was the first person that made me feel like I was seen as a coach. I, I didn't think anybody really noticed me um, because, because I shouldn't have been noticed. I was like a first or second year coach at the time and on a pretty large staff. And we shook hands one day and, and Coach Rana shook my hand and uh, he called me by name and said something nice to me. And we'd never spoken before that. And that was, that was a big change for me in terms of my confidence. So I hope everybody gets to enjoy Coach Rana's talk and, and, uh, I know he's going to deliver on some pretty good stuff. So thanks everybody for listening. And, and if you want to reach out at all, uh, I know there's still some questions coming up. Just email me, Ken at boostinstitute.ca. And uh, I can give you all share anything with you. It's a, a good chunk of our stuff is free much to the chagrin of my business director. So. <laughs>